Okay, so basically I'm going to try and try and talk about everything. So I'd like you to imagine what it's like to be me trying to get through this in time. And um, the art of empathy is stepping in imaginatively into somebody else's shoes, understanding their feelings and perspective, and using that understanding to guide your actions. That's Roman Canaris latest book on empathy um, as a sort of short definition. And that my issue is, is empathy, the account tends to be very individualistic. And the question I want to ask is, does empathy have the power to transform relationships from the personal to the political, and also to operate as a catalyst that could create fundamental social change by having um, more empathy out there in individuals? Research suggests that empathy is considered a motivating factor for unselfish, pro-social um, behaviour, whereas a lack of empathy is related to antisocial behaviour and, in some literature, psychopathy. So that's a big de declaration about empathy, and I, I do think there's a bullshit factor in the world. You know, I know that Obama said there is an empathy deficit in America, but actually, you know, when we make these statements and restorative justice as a process which is embedded in the British legal system does make those statements, it's a big, it's a big promise. And so we, I, I think as a designers and as um, people in, in the world, we need to understand what we mean by empathy better. So Adam's already mentioned cognitive and affective empathy. And there's lots of work on, on how it's described. So, to put it simply to you, cognitive empathy is about understanding. So somebody like a psychopath could understand you, know, you. might not have any feeling for you, but could understand you. So don't imagine that you know, people with empathy deficits don't always get the cognitive dimension or the affective dimension. They do it differently. But feeling for you, feeling how you feel, is complex. So Baron Cohen, who's probably in the UK the person who writes on empathy, is based in Cambridge. His work on um, sort of autism is very, very highly regarded. He says three things. First of all, that empathy is not equally distributed in individuals. And you will all know somebody who's a much sort of more sympathetic person than perhaps you are. Um, well, in my case, definitely. Um, and those who experience empathy don't do it in the same ways or have the same amounts of feeling. It's not like you just get the same quote right an ear at birth. You know, get your empathy bit. And some people also appear to what Baron Cohen suggests is zero degrees of empathy. So he's trying to move out of the moral account. But he says that some people have an empathy deficit for real, and it's been measured, and I'll talk about that a bit more. So his work, as I've explained, is with Asperger's and autism. And um, he, he, you know, you'd have to go and look at some of those fantastic videos on, on um, what's been happening now in sort of uh, design for autism. It's amazing. And, and that to genuinely understand what happens in autism and Asperger's syndrome, you know, it's beyond a lecture this long. It would take me all day to explain it. Baron Cohen's work is noted for um, the notion that, you know, basically, he argues that all of us have some degree of empathy. So uh, somebody who's got zero degrees of effective empathy might have a lot of cognitive empathy. And he talks about, you know, that in average, there's, you know, the, the bell curve is always laughed at as a sort of a, a construct. But he says the, there's an average of low to medium and high empathy. And he says, but the difference is, is that with autistic people, they have very little cognitive. They have very understanding of the theory of mind. So they don't understand your perspective. So when you come at them, you know, if you have your hands raised in a particular way, you can cause alarm. Psychopaths absolutely get what you're doing. They just don't care about you. And so he, he makes these distinctions at other ends of the scales. And um, he says that... You know, but that's not the psychology of our equipment in our head. It's not just that the, you know, the, the account. Actually, cultural factors are massively um, important, and some people seem to find obedience to an authority figure, you know, uh, much more attractive than others who don't like authority. And you know, he talks about certain cultural situations where there have been totally, you know, massive, massive lapses of empathy. And he talks about the way ideology, you know, ideas in, in, in circulation can, can actually affect um, how people see things. And so, like, you know, it was only, I think, in the 70s that Sweden stopped sterilising people. But the eugenics movement, you know, was a powerful force in, 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 in the sort of Nazi thing. And actually, in terms of um, 
basically, you know, what happened. I mean, 65,000 Americans with learning uh, disabilities were sterilized. This has gone on all over the world in different ways but for about different issues. But, you know, like, look at the cultural implications of that. Do you really understand another or their needs? And so history shows that many nations have shown no empathy in, in regard to those they regard as outsider groups or, you know, <coughs> infidels. So we can talk about Rwanda, we can talk about ISIS if you want. Um, it's complex. But it seems to me, like, just in our own culture, you know, like UK culture, um, let's look at Ched Evans, because I, I, you know, like, I couldn't get Ched Evans. Ched Evans got in bed with a woman who was in bed with another footballer who appeared to be completely drunk and said she gave him permission. Well, you know, I mean, it may be that he's deluded, or maybe the guy has no empathy at all to be actually um, understanding how, what that girl's situation was. I've been appalled that he can't apologise to her. I've also, you know, I, I can see that class, you know, that she's nothing, misogyny, she's nothing, might be part of his ideology. I, I'd ask what empathy he has. I, I'm astonished that his girlfriend and the rich father-in-law have quite a lot of empathy for his loss of career. You know, what about her life? So when we talk about others who have no empathy, sometimes we might have to look closer to home. Um, so it seems to me that empathy is not always good. So we think, oh yeah, I should be more empathetic, I should understand more. But actually, lots of people say that. Research from teaching is showing that it's more difficult to empathise when there are differences between people, between status, culture, religion, language, skin colour, gender, age, and so on. You know, and like, personally, I always, we're all ethnically different, all of us. We all come from different places. I often feel uh, quite different in this environment, and I could go on about that all way. It's sort of, talk, there's lots of research on ethno-cultural empathy. That it's easier to have empathy towards others um, who are similar to you, that you find similar. And I, I think that's really very interesting in terms of what the uh, uses of empathy might be and what the problems might be. So I, I put those providers, and I'd always talk about um, other factors. So how do we understand what empathy is? And the obvious example is always, you know, in most psychoanalytic theories, go back to mum and baby. The fact that some people don't have mothers and were brought up by the fathers seems to be not something that's taught. But the argument is, is that we learn to feel uh, love and affection from, from the experiences that we have and that maltreatment and abuse have massive effects. But, you know, in a very simple way, they talk about, you know, theorists across the board, psychoanalysts, they talk about that as a baby, to get fed, you have to sort of respond and figure out where to snuggle you know, how to be, to, to actually get fed. At about four months, you start to develop more accounts. And so the argument, there is a relationship between how you're nurtured and how you understand empathy. There are also three biological factors shown to affect empathetic development. So there's the gene stuff, you know, there's lots of stuff, uh, which I always find slightly dubious, um, about sort of genes and delinquency. Then there's the uh, hormone stuff. You know, there, there are absolute studies that show that prenatal testosterone affects the brain development, and they go back and measure these kids. I won't bore you with that. And there's also brain structure, you know, pineal gland, stuff about that, about how damage to brains of highly empathetic people after accident shows that they behave differently, they have less empathy. I've seen extraordinary um, documentaries of people who have, um, you know, this builder who actually a sort of drill went through his face. And basically, it sort of he didn't seem to care at all about his family, but he started painting. And it made me really uh, fascinated about how the brain works, but that's a aside. Anyway, so, so what they're saying is that empathy is probably a good thing sometimes, but actually too much empathy might not be a good thing. So from nursing, what they show is that those um, nurses who have really strong levels of connection, who are really good at um, you know, making patients feel cared for, and there are lots of schemes where doctors are, are sort of trained to sort of look at the patient because they don't and talk to them you know, in the first person. But they argue that if there's too much empathy, then it makes it impossible for you to do your job. You know, and I, I really get that. I think that, how do you get the balance anyway? Long story, and we won't go into that. So, so a big question for me, you know, from a design point of view, is whether design can make a contribution to how empathy is experienced, whether or not empathy can be learned or enhanced, and Baron Cohen's work with autism and new work on, from neuroscience and brain suggests absolutely that to some degree that empathy can be taught and learned. 
And here are some of the tools that I found, you know, here are some tools that Cohen uses and other tools um, that helps us recognise emotions and deal with empathy. So, in terms of autism, there are two systems. There's an animation a series to help children with autism at age between two and eight year old uh, recognise and understand emotions. Have any of you familiar with that work? Have you heard of it? But it's the idea that, you know, smiling, you know, what smiling means may not be. And they go through this really basic stuff that most of us just learn naturally. And actually they can, they can adapt. There's also Mind Read, which is another reference work covering a broader range of emotions where kids are given spaces to increase their cognitive, you know, theory of mind types of empathy. Um, but there are many cultural experiments out there. So one of the ones that I'm fascinated with, having come from a massive family where there are always loads of babies, is that there's this new project in Canada, America, and now the UK, where they take babies into the classroom. I've got a friend who's a shrink, and she goes, it's an amazing project. And I go, why do you have to take a baby into the classroom? She said, you take a baby into the classroom, and you ask the kids what they think is happening. And she said, it's fascinating to learn from them how they see things. And so what Roots of Empathy does, it's a program that gets kids um, to try and uh, understand the position of the baby, to try and empathise with the baby's emotion, and in the same time understand their own. Um, there are projects, another social innovation project called the Human Library. I'm going to do one here. If anyone wants to help me, you're invited. I think we're going to do a graffiti empathy library, but it's basically where the books are people who are asked to talk from one position. So. You know, the copper might be a clarinet player, but he's going to come in and talk about being a police officer or a graffiti. And the artist who's been to prison will talk about that experience. So we have a range of people as books, and then the, the, the reading is the conversation with the public. And it's how, you know, the books are taken out on loan. There's a system with cards. Where... Okay, there's the blind cafe. Have any of you ever been to the blind cafe? I, I took a client once with Adam, and so what happened is that you get there... You know, you sign in and basically you're, you're taken in the dark and you experience and you eat food in the dark. And the idea is it enhances your, your experience of the food. But it's, yeah, it's a, an, um, a way of get, getting people to understand disability. The best experience of me of understanding disability was to come off my bike and end up in a wheelchair and I realised all the actual sort of light switches are the wrong height from my chair. But that was a different experience. But it's, it's that sort of empathetic experience. Then there's the Parents Circle Forum, which is much more of a conflict um, uh, management uh, approach. It's a joint Palestinian and Israeli organisation of under, over 600 families. So if your son is murdered in Palestine as a Jewish parent, it's a Palestine parent whose son has been murdered by a Jewish pe person that will, will speak to you. And it's about forgiveness, really, and sharing stories. Um, there is the Forgiveness Project. Um, that I find a really difficult read. Um, it's basically uh, a way of helping people get over their experience. And, you know, I've, I've heard a human rights lawyer say to me that one of the problems he has with the Forgiveness Project is that it creates professional victims, people who go around talking about their victims, what happened to them. And he thinks it gets them stuck. But I think it's a fascinating social innovation. There's lots of... Um, exhibitions, there's lots of uh, approaches to learning that um, I think in schools, you know, to, in terms of gun crime, stabbing and knife crime have a contribution. In terms of the universal design movement, um, Patricia Moore, uh, some of you might know her work, she dressed up as an old lady for two years and basically sort of worked out that most of the objects in the built environment sort of are not designed for seniors. And um, the Agnes suit that Adam showed you is probably a development of Patty Moore's work. Um, certainly there are many suits. So there's the obesity suit. You can try it. I, I really was, I did ask my, um, Matthew if he would get some of them. Um, but he wouldn't. Um, but you know, in America, that some of the design for public space has you know, asked us to consider that people may not be the same size as you. There are the pregnancy suits aimed at dealing with um, NHS uh, environments. Um, so I gave a project in 2011 to this, this, this course, and like, you know, when we talked about um, creating experience for bus drivers and people using prams to understand each other, the first responses were better prams, you know, they're fucking dark. But what I wanted the students to do is design so the bus driver understood 
what the, the woman, it's like for the woman, you know, annoying everyone, slowing the bus down, what it's like for her, and for the bus driver, what it's like to be spat at and have people shout at you for not going fast enough. And so they, they came up, they, they just, they, they, um, the students, it's a quick project, but the students in your course, they decided what the conflict was. And normally I would want them to engage with the community so they had to find their own. The snoring was quite a popular device, so um, the, the, the person who, the student who designed this, um, Tanata, ar argued that the person who was the snorer was made to feel terrible. And so she designed an app that woke up the snorer and the, for the non-snorer she got to war what it's like and feel like what it's like to be a snorer. And there are a range of projects. So this one was um, like a Google type project where you know you get to read what it's like to be a demonised Muslim because every time it mentions somebody of your description which could be young male it says you know instead of saying Muslim it says young male and then you get to read what it might be like to be positioned like that and um, the uh, hijab by Joe Lee were, was actually designed um, so that it was two experiences one for passport control so that they got to uh, feel what it's like to be told to take off your veil and then for, their, for, 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 for the veil wearer to understand what it's like for passport control not to be able to recognise anybody and we had quite a lot of fun this was my favourite this was um, Polly the Parrot who repeated to you know if you're a bit of a depressing person and you moan all the time well the parrot repeats it back to you what you're saying and so you realise that you may need to improve your metaphors. It was, it was quite a fun project, but Roman Canaric, who I've mentioned, is arguing that we should design an empathy museum for the world, that actually there is a deficit of empathy. Certainly for me in prison, that would be a very, very viable, uh, a very viable thing to design, because in prison, people turn off their empathy in order to, to survive. It's a very violent and aggressive place. And actually, you know, to go back in the world, you have to connect with people. So, I don't think it's so ridiculous, the idea that we might design an empathetic experience. In fact, I think it has a massive thing to contribute, and people are doing that already. So our team have become interested in visual material linked to the design for empathy and creative practice, particularly with the work of the National Alliance of Arts and Criminal Justice, who can design against crime, who have looked at the way the arts can build empathy and lead to desistance. So some examples. So Geese Theatre, going into prison, I love applied theatre. I think it's got an amazing transformative effect. And my Andy, the guy in the mask there, basically talking in this um, in this paragraph, he talks about going into prison and working with sex offenders and designing a stage where the, the actual offenders are looking at each other and the offenders are also acting. And he talks about the fact that, that not only does the cathartic experience of engaging with reenacting what's happened, you know, release some stuff, but it enables all present to experience it. And um, yeah, I, I think he, he talks about the fact that, that, you know, empathy needs to have permission and that within a very shut down audience of people, you know, you could have a student group that wasn't empathetic, that you might have to give them permission. And he talks about the way that physical acting out as well as words makes a massive difference. There's loads of projects. In prison they use the gamelan music system, which looks a bit like it was... Um, you know, an ancient system, but in an hour they get the prisoners to cooperate with each other. So in order to create a tune in an hour using these percussion instruments, you have to really look at other people, sort of anticipate what they might need from the song, and they do, they do this work. And the argument is, is that this is not just like a nice time where we learn about music. This is actually about teaching skills of cooperation, it's teaching basic skills that are missing even in some student groups. Um, the Mural Arts program, a program in uh, Philadelphia is a slightly different take on the same account. But basically what happened was the mayor was just fed up with all his community being sent to prison um, for, for marks on walls and basically 30 years ago tried to do something about it. And one of the ways he tried to do something about it was by accepting that creativity, you know, the design of spaces actually has an influence on who people are. And so he brought in the artist Jane Golden to persuade, pers persuade those that were damaging the environment to do something different, to create mural art. And, you know, this is what it looked like in 1984. And, you know, in, in 2000, the, 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 the sort of ex-offenders start running programs. They run the programs in prison so that the canvases are made in prison, then put on the walls using scaffolding. But it sort of required those inmates and those uh, returning citizens to collaborate with the community, to say to the community, what do you want to see? 
to try and, and, and cooperate, to see each other's point of view. And you may or may not like the art, but it seems to have made, um, a, diff made for a different place. Okay, and I won't go on about that because it's not time. So all the projects that I've sort of showed you in different ways engage with communities. It enables, I suppose, the sort of collaboration that Adam was trying to break down in quite a technical way to occur. And as designers, I suppose that you need to think about if you're engaging with such processes, how you might do that. Like, to get ex-offenders to consider the perspective of, of others in the community that they've offended against, which is that the basis of re restorative justice, is a complex process, and that, that is part of me, you know, just standing back. You know, as I said, my friends are shrink. And I know that certain, like, sort of 20 to 25 percent of people in prison have mental health problems. But you know, if you've been a victim of a massively violent crime, it may be very difficult to put that, they call it conference, together of the victim and the offender. So the sort of work we can do, maybe that has a process in building, you know, a prequel stage, these other capacities in, 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 in society. And, the, you know, the, the Philadelphia project is also about making colourful cities as well as helping the excluded and connecting people. And for me, you know, colour's always better. So it seems to me that you can't force people to engage with each other, but maybe creativity, like design, art and design can have some other contribution that, that has the magic bit that's missing. We don't feel we've been told off all the time, really. And so I, the question I want to ask you, and the question I ask myself is, can empathy build, build up by what I'm calling proxy processes? These are the processes where it's not the person who's experienced the thing, but it's just us that are going through this. Can it, can, it, can it develop? And it seems to me that creative practice suggests that, you know, from theatre, from music, from writing in prison and other areas, from mural art, suggests, yes, it can make a difference. That, um, that direct contract between the perpetrator and victim as a restorative justice might, might be a very good thing, but also there are these other processes that we could be engaged in. And so the questions I ask myself is how might we build empathy before crime occurs? You know, because like, you know, to, to be a serial killer, and you know, just, I'm sorry, I'll take an extreme example, of course, I don't know any, I don't think I do anyway. Um, but to be a serial, you have to see a person as an object. You can't see, to, to kill somebody, to snuff them, you can't see them as a person. So how can we build empathy before crime occurs? And maybe serial killers wouldn't be our number one choice of people that we're trying to engage with. But maybe with graffiti artists there is, there is an issue. How can we use proxy processes if the victim finds it unacceptable to meet the, process, the, the perpetrator? So often in prison and outside of prison, in the probation service, in the youth offender teams, in the gang crime teams that are working in London, they try and act out stuff in different ways in order, I suppose, to have a, a value. Um, and but for me, I, would, I, I think that given that most prisoners turn off their empathy, how could we, how could we take prison um, as a place to, to promote better experiences of empathy and compassion. And so um, I suppose we end up with a notion about conflict resolution, which is always a bit pants. And so I wanted to step back really and say, well, so when we think about empathy, we've been talking really about the individual. If you talk about autistic people, you talk about psychopaths, you're talking about individuals. But actually, Richard Sennett, you know, who is one of the theories on public space, the theorists, um, in this book, I think has a different account of um, how empathy might have a relationship to collective design and collective space. Um, he talks about cooperation requiring social skills, okay, that for us to, to have any transaction that's productive, we need to be able to cooperate. But cooperation requires us to be able to listen, to be able to behave tactfully, to find points of agreement, to manage disagreement, to avoid frustration in difficult discussions. And he says that actually society, particularly consumer society that promotes the individual, you know, what do you want, um, actually diskills people in practicing cooperation in complex ways. Because it tells us if we just buy the right thing, you know, we'll be happy. Whereas cooperation is actually linked to happiness. And so he argues that uh, cooperation precedes individuation. You know, individuation is the process when the child separates from the parent. Yeah? He talks about cooperation as the foundation, of, the foundation stone of human development, that we learn how to be together with the mother, and then we learn how to stand apart but together. And he talks about pe uh, positive cooperation becoming a learning experience 
um, rather than thought, thoughtless sharing. And so I suppose that, you know, for you, I'd ask you to ask yourself, what's the difference between sympathy and empathy? You know, how is it when you feel sympathetic? Sympathy is usually being thought of as stronger sentiment. Um, I feel your pain, you know, I, I feel sorry for you. Whereas empathy, it, it invites you to, I suppose, activate your own curiosity. And um, I think that empathy can have a political application if you wanted it to. Certainly in design, you know, we go out, we use user groups and then go back to design for empathy to sell people things. It seems to me that em more <laughs> empathy could also be seen in different ways. Design for empathy, you know, design for mediation is a realistic thing in, in, the, in society that we live in to want to focus upon. Um, but saying it says like, get real about this, you know, just the projects I showed you where you, you know, design for one experience and then you show the other person, you know, what it might be like, you know, that may not change anything. You might create a fantastically empathetic experience, but the woman who's listening to the snoring just wants him dead and cannot be um, actually persuaded that living with a snorer is enough. I've heard people make those cases. So, so it argues that we have to understand how we came to be people. That tribalism and collusion, like them and us, like where you, you sort of use your cooperation in complex ways, needs to be addressed by any design for empathy. And he talks about the notion of the dialogic, which is a word um, coined by a Russian literary critic, uh, comes from things called formaliz formalism in, in the, um, linguistics. Um, he talks about that, you know, the dialogic understands that there can be no common ground sometimes. But although shared agreements may be reached through the process of exchange, actually what design for empathy might be about is building understanding so that we understand that the consensus might not be for us, that we might have to disagree. And I think that in a democracy, you know, when Adam talked about um, uh, sort of Gramsci, um, in a democracy, designing for consensus is what we do. We obscure some voices. And I suppose that designing for empathy might ask us to do something else, which might lead to agonism, an agonistic space. So what do I mean by agonism? So agonism is not the same as antagonism, you know, where you're against each other. Agonism is an understanding that actually meaning, the struggle for meaning, the struggle for more democracy is always a context. In liberal pluralism, you know, we actually do consensus politics, which means that some voices don't get heard because the, the majority take the vote. With, with agonism, it's, it's about understanding that there may always be um, a striving, um, a discussion that has to happen. Chantal Mouffe is probably the most interesting critic on agonism. And she describes that in public concepts where dissensus occurs, often we try to obscure that, you know, that, that that difference, that, um, that space. And that is perfectly reasonable for different and oppositional perspectives to, to exist. But within democracy, often you know, we have to get to a baseline so that we can go forward. And so often we stamp out those voices. And so um, the public realm is agonistic space sort of understands the different way the publics inhabit it. Because what is a public? A public, you know, is not a group of people out there, but often a group of people that come to me at a particular time. Um, I'm going to invite Marcus Wilcox, who's been working on the Graphilution Graf project, to come and speak to me on this, because basically we, we start to look at public space in terms of uh, graffiti in different ways, because it's about what issues spark a public into being, and it seems to me it's worth a discussion um, now. So to recap, agonism is about the notion of a contest. You know, so it could be a fight. It doesn't have to be. It's about the fact that there is dissent. And um, it seems to me that graffiti has always um, tried to address dissent, you know, usually through political slogans and other creative strategies um, which make up agonistic space. Um, but in the UK, graffiti has been defined as antisocial behaviour. It's been defined as an offence, um, which involves the painting or writing or the soiling of walls. And we, we talk a lot about broken window syndrome, the idea that you know, if these signs of damage occur, then actually you know, it's sort of the beginning of the end, really. And that's become dominant wisdom, but actually may not be true. 
So graffiti is usually associated with vandalism rather than placemaking, rather than regenerative strategies, which it does have. Like just look at Hoxton, look at Brighton. Many places where graffiti has made a positive um, contribution. And so I suppose what we're going to ask you to do in this project is try and see all the perspectives that impact on graffiti through personas that Adam and Marcus will talk about. But certainly, um, for many police officers, graffiti is anything that exists in public space, even really good art, if it doesn't have permission. And so, um, for some, graffiti can be understood as a sort of, I suppose, um, uh, a threat. For others, it, it's about making, making places, making spaces. Um, broken window theory probably came into being about 30 years ago and certainly um, started to construe graffiti as a signal crime, a signal that all was going to hell. Um, I think that it's time to campaign against that position. Um, what, the, what the artists, you know, graffiti artists or vandals, depending on your perspective, say is that the space was all public space was always ours and that we are entitled to, um, to, to inhabit it. We're entitled to have our voices heard. And that um, writing was a way of saying, you know, graffiti was a way of saying, don't make decisions without us, don't exclude us. Um, certainly, um, the project we're doing, we've heard from many different voices. Um, and I don't particularly perceive graffiti as deviance, although I accept that some people do and that we may not be able to resolve this conflict. Um, I'm going to ask Marcus to talk about some case studies that have tried to um, resolve the agonism that is graffiti. So this is Diffuser. Over to you, Marcus. Thanks, Lorraine. Um, where many of the graffiti writers we speak to tell us are you know, it's fine for an advertiser to put their voice on the street, uh, but it's not fine for me to put my voice on the street. They're talking about what we understand as this a notion of agonistic practice, or agonism through practice, if you like. And this project um, set up by a collective called Diffusor in Spain was about trying to facilitate a, a space where graffiti writers or, or, or anyone actually could have a go at getting their voice on street through visual practice without having to uh, release their identity and so really it was a scheme they designed this they designed a, a, a kind of a registration system where the council was happy because a, a writer could sign up and get some permission but at the same time the council never, or the authority would never know the identity of that writer. Um, interestingly, what happened is when they started to, so in the distance behind those trees are some of the walls they started to use. When they started to use the, those walls and paint on them, two, two unexpected things happened. One was um, some of the residents from the street where they started it off fed back and said, oh, we didn't really like the scribbles that were on these walls before, but actually there seems to be a, a wider range of of practice happening now and that's more interesting and the other thing that happened was the the guys that are running it said oh we didn't expect we expected only graffiti writers to sign up but actually they found that more than just graffiti writers signed up so you were getting other members of communities who thought oh yeah I want to have actually I want to have a go at making some visual mark in the city where I'm not usually allowed and um, so some where a lot of these pieces are made by fairly either experienced or respected or want to be, you know, graffiti writers, street artists. A small portion of them are also made by, by residents, by graphic designers, by artists, by people with an interest in visual practice. And that to us has been really interesting that the, it's sort of, in a way, in, in, in the context of agonism, it's helped widen the conversation. So the conversation doesn't just be quick, become between the aggressor, the aggressive, you know, writer and the aggressive uh, crime prevention practitioner trying to in this sort of eternal ball of but the of design job is to actually figure out a way of resolving a problem, which is like you know them against us. And so this website, you don't give me name and address, it's numbers. But if you get near, so somebody comes up to you and says you're a police officer, you shouldn't be here. You've got a piece of official paper with your number on. So although the authorities don't know you, who you are, you get a document from the authorities that gives you authorisation. 
And it, you know, for us, I think that I've never seen anything like that in the UK. It's a, it was a social innovation that the I. Clo the closest Lorraine and I could think was it's a bit like having a skip number in the UK. <laughs> you know, if you want to do some works, but in this case, it's. You know, I think people would find this kind of work on a street more interesting than looking at a skip. So the design, the the the, the, the um, person who created this, you know, the job now is to scale it to design how it might be shared elsewhere. And we're going to try and do some of that work. But here's another scheme. Sorry, this is where it is. But here's another scheme. Do you want to talk about street art dealer Marthas? Yeah, and I mean Adam can chip in on this as well. Um, C6 uh, or Dot Master, a, a street artist we know well. Um, has spent a long time, he's, he's has years of experience, Some of it, a lot of his time he spends trying to sell work to private clients, to, through galleries and so on, and got really annoyed by the gallery system which take usually take 50% or so of, of any work that gets sold and um, the notion of him still very much being in, immersed in, in the world of, sort of street art and informal visual practice on, in street environments. He wanted to find a way that the, the, the sort of the middleman could be cut out a little bit and the the artists who are genuinely those artists who are generally interested in actually sharing their work and perhaps making some a bit of a living or at least getting some rip, some income from their work um, without losing such a cut. They invented this system where they introduced QR tags as almost as stickers on the street. So where they put up a bit of work, they introduce a sticker, people can photograph the, the tag and then access a whole gallery of who's made the work, how can I buy a print of it, how can I access other, other services and offers that you get not typically through a built gallery space. This was, t what, 10 years ago? I was say, it happened years and years so, ago. Although conversation now around. it's not radical, but... <laughs> That was my mate I've known for 20 years that came from a conversation we had about if public space has got to be paid for, then how can we pay for public, how would you pay for public space from the bottom up rather than the top down? So the, the, one, the, one of the things we used to talk about was, imagine if you had a shop and instead of selling the shop, the side of your shop to add shelf um, to be able to put up something to use by the open, well maybe actually you could turn the side of your shop over to street art dealer and actually people could put their work on there and you might get a cut from everything that came up through the QR code. So every purchase was made, actually you might get some of the money back from the person whose wall it was. And the other thing we wanted to do was to be able to start to reward, um, basically a bit like the, that's what the geotagging bit of it was about. That it becomes a bit of a game for the people that are into graffiti. So that you can go, to, and, then, and also then we were talking about how you build in bonuses for early adopters. So basically the idea that if you, when, by the time everybody just turns up down there, because they're just sort of like joining on the bandwagon, then actually you're at a point where the price of those, of purchasing one, a print of that, that you've seen on the wall, will go up. But if you, were, if you got there early, you know, if you were one of the first people to see it, then actually, you know, you could, you could you'd get, a, you'd get, it, you'd get it for cheap or you'd get it for free. You get the picture. This is um, by Moose, and I, I, we got Moose to speak for us, you know, he does reverse cleaning. And he said that once he was arrested by a police officer for theft of dirt. So I found that hilarious. I just find it, you know, I mean, they had to let him out, it was his birthday, but, but they took him in, he was a bit stroppy. And he said, well, what have I done? I've just, they said, well, you've stolen dirt from public space, so there you go. But it seemed to me that what and was, now the police have adopted and this strategy. Well, it's a radical strategy, it because like in Brazil, when the, when the reverse cleaners were, you know, doing the tunnels, it made the, the council clean up the space. And the police have sort of stolen the idea for crime prevention. But there are different ways of using social innovation, is really what we wanted to say. And so to conclude, because we're overrunning in terms of time, I have to say what I said at the beginning, the world doesn't need any more products that compromise the sustainability of plants, <laughs> of the planet, sorry, but does need experience opportunities to be designed in, into cultural life that help us manage and understand and appreciate difference. I work on crime. You know, what I know is often the crime problem is not the problem, there are other problems. You know, so in designing um, new ways, it seems to me we can try to make design research and applied design make a contribution to restorative processes in the community. And I don't just mean about restorative justice. Restorative is about making people feel better, it's about well-being. Also, to actually try and do something about finding new ways to manage conflict. There's so much of it in the world. 
It seems to me that's a real role for design. Thank you.